Hey everyone, I'm Terry Moran. We're coming on the air because we have breaking news right now. A jury in Manhattan has found the Trump Organization guilty of tax fraud and several charges. Uh, this is a case that was brought uh, in New York City. It is a uh, criminal case against the Trump Organization, the company that former President Donald Trump owned. His father founded it, and uh, prosecutors had investigated it and alleged that there was essentially a funds from the business that were distributed uh, without tax consequences to executives, not including, in this instance, Donald Trump himself, but things like Mercedes-Benz and cash at Christmas time and fancy apartments were provided to others without the knowledge of the IRS and without the tax consequences that such transfers uh, should require under law. And so this is a guilty verdict by a jury in Manhattan against the Trump Organization. A lot of people have been watching this. For more, let's bring in ABC News contributor. Against the company, uh, and the jury has found beyond a reasonable doubt that they engaged in criminal conduct in essentially providing perks uh, to executives without properly accounting for them under the tax laws. Uh, how serious is this, and, right. and what does this tell you about the prosecution? Okay, so... It's very serious because it really talks about a systematic scheme to defraud or or misrepresent what you should legitimately be taxed for, and it goes to to your point, Terry. Individuals that worked uh, for the Trump organization um, to you know under evaluating buildings. I mean, the government really had to show sort of a systematic scheme by the Trump Organization of all sorts of, of basically tax evasion or tax fraud, maybe both, um, and were able to convince a jury that that really was the case. Now, if the question is, is anybody going to go to jail, I, I don't know about that because it's the corporation that was charged, but it could just be a massive amount of money, and it will create, I think, uh, all sorts of problems for the Trump Organization as far as credit, getting credit, uh, and in, in anything that has to do with finances that they may need to continue to promote the organization. And that is essentially, thank you, Brad, was at the heart of the trial. The jurors had to decide uh, that this was done to benefit the organization. The organization, the company is the defendant. The company's defense was, it was our accountant, our chief financial officer, Alan Weisselberg, who was a longtime associate of Donald Trump and who, uh, you may recall, had, uh, had cooperated with prosecutors after personally being investigated. And the defense was we, the organization did not, was not aware of any benefits it might have accrued from Weisselberg's conduct. The jury rejected that and said that this was done to benefit the Trump Organization. There you see Letitia James, the New York State Attorney General. Brad, I want to ask about this. So she is the one who initiated this investigation and this prosecution, the Attorney General of the Sovereign State of New York, and she said she ran for re-election on I will get Trump. I don't know, there's something that's mm -hmm. the civil libertarian in me that thinks that's not the way things should go. Well, no, Terry, but, you know, politicians, we both hear this every day, say grandiose, self-serving things. And does that fit that category? Probably. But, you know, they can say anything they want. You're talking about in front of seasoned judges using seasoned prosecutors to present a case. I mean, tax fraud, think about it. Uh, it's documents. It's emails. It's text messages. It's direct conversations that may have been recorded. I mean, it gets very specific and so I think that there was overwhelming evidence of tax fraud in, as I mentioned earlier, a number of avenues. Uh, and so as a result, I think the jury really didn't have that big a problem in figuring out it's clear that tax fraud occurred in this case. That's a great point and a great distinction there, Brad. Thank you. Between whatever politicians say and the way things work in court, we well, got to prove it beyond a reasonable doubt, and prosecutors did in this case. Let's bring in our investigative reporter, Catherine Falders, who has, who has been uh, you know, on all of the lines of inquiry into Trump and the Trump Organization. Uh, I, I guess we just lost, so, so uh, Brad, I'll come back to you on, on that question of 
proving beyond a reasonable doubt. You talk about the prosecutors. Now, they had a cooperating witness. They had uh, the, the accountant, the chief financial officer for the corporation, Alan Weisselberg, who did cooperate. He did not co cooperate in an investigation of, of, of Donald Trump personally, but against the organization. And, and the defense was, well, he's just... He's just trying to help himself uh, get out of the trouble that he landed in. Many of these benefits were for Weisselberg. His kids were put into private school. He had a Mercedes Benz, all provided the expense of the company without telling the IRS. But the jury didn't buy it. They, they, they said, well, whatever his motives might be, the evidence is there. And that, once again, as you were suggesting, this was a well-run prosecution, it seems. Well, I think there's little doubt of that. And the other aspect of this is that for, to blame Weisselberg and, you know, it's, it's just him sort of manipulating is just ridiculous because you would have to show that the Trump organization systematically involved, was involved in tax fraud. In other words, clearly Weisselberg has admitted some of the things, if not all of the things he was involved in. But did he, did he have input from higher-ups in the Trump organization? Of course he did. So they would show a pattern of evidence and information of all of these other people that have fed in to this tax fraud conspiracy. So my guess is, I mean, that's really no defense based on what I think the government had to show this was a systematic tax fraud case. And it, and it failed. Uh, with the jury, uh, as I say, but the Trump Organization is out with a statement after these guilty verdicts on conspiracy and tax fraud uh, against the Trump Organization. And uh, the organization statement deals with Mr. Alan Weisselberg, who was the former chief financial officer and has now uh, essentially cooperated with prosecutors. Here's the Trump Organization statement as follows, quote, Mr. Weisselberg testified under oath that he, quote, betrayed the trust the company had placed in him and that he at all times acted, quote, solely for his, quote, own personal gain and out of his, quote, own personal greed. Uh, th that would have been what uh, Weisselberg acknowledged in his guilty plea. The Trump Organization statement continues, the notion that a company could be held responsible for an employee's actions to benefit themselves on their own personal tax returns is simply preposterous. Now, uh, uh, Brad, if I could just come back to you once more, they're now, that's, that's a case on appeal, isn't it? You see the, the Trump Organization well, guilty counts there. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm sure it will be, but that's a, that's a great statement for the people who don't really know or understand this case, which is gonna be, quite frankly, a majority of folks who have heard about this case. So that's kind of a self-serving, you know, it's him, it's not us. But to go back to what I said earlier, Terry, there is mountains of evidence that shows the coordinated systematic tax fraud that goes beyond just what happened with Weisselberg. Uh, and now look, in every case, the criminal cases, the violent criminal cases you and I have talked about, there are many times our informants. Are informants self-serving? Sure they are, but you still have to prove the case. Right. And sometimes uh, they may be self-serving, but they're telling the truth. And the jury here certainly uh, believed the prosecution and its witnesses. Let's bring in our investigative uh, ed executive editorial producer, John Santucci. John, uh, you know this organization and the Trump, uh, Trump himself so well. You've reported on him for years for us. So let me ask you about this verdict. What, what's your reaction? What does it tell you first about the Trump organization what, and, and about Donald Trump? himself in whatever jeopardy or, or risk he may face now. Well, the big thing has always been, Terry, that the risk was going to be that if they were found guilty of a felony, and they've been found guilty now of multiple felonies, uh, the banks could come calling. And this could be the biggest problem uh, that would happen for the Trump Organization. Because as we've reported over the years, many of Donald Trump's businesses um, have been on the books with many banks, Deutsche Bank, Bank of America. So if any of us, you, me, apply for a mortgage,
mortgage. We get our mortgage. If we are convicted of a felony, Terry, the bank could come calling and say, hi there, we don't want to do business with you anymore. And that has been the fear for many executives and many family members of Donald Trump, that if they were found guilty, this could happen. Look, if you've talked to people that have been around Donald Trump for the last several weeks, as this trial has gone on for some time, it was delayed uh, due to COVID at one point uh, early on, uh, many people will tell you that Donald Trump was going around Mar-a-Lago saying, well, it's a New York jury. They're going to convict me. It's going to happen. They're going to find me guilty. And ultimately, that's what's happened here. There were conversations, we know, Terry, early on between attorneys for the Trump Organization and prosecutors in the Manhattan DA's office as lawyers tried to come to a deal, said, listen, we'll plead to something. We just don't want to touch a felony because if we plead guilty to a felony, it's the same thing as is happening right now as we're seeing. Uh, ultimately, they'd have a problem with their lenders. So now is going to be the question of how this moves forward. We've reached out uh, to members of the Trump family, to the former president, to see if they will appeal. you got to imagine that that is certainly going to happen. But that statement we obtained, which you just shared with our viewers, uh, it is very clear they are trying to blame Alan Weisselberg. And, and as Terry, you'll recall, you know, this was a person uh, that had been very loyal uh, to Donald Trump. He worked for Donald Trump's father uh, before he ended up working for the Trump Organization. Uh, Donald Trump was stunned uh, when we actually told him that Weisselberg was led uh, into court in cuffs uh, this time last summer when this trial first began. Um, but that statement, I I mean, it's stunning. Yet again, Donald Trump uh, uses the age-old adage, oh, uh, that person did their own thing. I knew nothing about it, uh, even though Weisselberg is someone that Donald Trump has written glowingly uh, about over the years, how close he was uh, to Trump and the family. Yeah, well, to use a, a, a New York New York phrase, he's dead to him now, right? Yes, uh, exactly. after, after, after. But let, let me ask you about the scale of what we're talking about. So, yeah. so Weisselberg acknowledged about $2 million dollars worth mm -hmm. of uh, ill-gotten gains in yeah. what is essentially a moving of money uh, or, or, or personal benefits that he got an apartment, his kid's private school, yep. a Mercedes-Benz yep. from the company without acknowledging it to the IRS. Right. Prosecutor says that, in effect, is the company paying him more and not putting it on the books. Yeah. Uh, and that is a benefit to the company. That's why the company's been convicted. But I just want to, that figure, $2 million, mm. So it jumps out of me. That's not a lot of money in a company this size, is it? it and I'm just wondering about the extent of the criminality that the jury has found here. It's not a lot, Terry, but we have to remember this is not the only case into Donald Trump's finances that is currently going on. There is a longtime civil investigation led by the New York Attorney General. You mentioned we saw her walking out of court there. This was not her case, to be very clear. There was a joint agreement of prosecutors working together, prosecutors from the Manhattan DA's office Office, which brought this case, and the New York Attorney General's office, that is the case that I'm referring to, they worked together because they were going down similar paths, if you will. The Manhattan DA case focused strictly on these fringe benefits that you mentioned, the cars, the apartments, the school tuition, et cetera. But the New York Attorney General's probe has looked more into Donald Trump's evaluation and devaluation of properties. And we've seen the charges she has brought. Now, they are civil charges, but they come with a hefty fine. That's way more than $2 million. We're in the hundreds of millions of dollars in that case. But I think what both of these cases show is, frankly, just the way that the Trump Organization has done business for multiple years, the way that they tried to touch that red line and ultimately, as this case proves, cross it. Hmm. Uh, John, I thank you for correcting me. I got my Trump investigations kind of tangled up there. <laughs> you can keep them all. You, you can, There's too many, but, Terry. You, we you have an Excel sheet. <laughs> I know you keep them straight. Uh, Trump himself. Yeah. Look, th this is, th it's got his name on it, right? Mm -hmm. This is the organization founded by his dad, and it's something that is linked to his identity, his public image, and, and probably, you know, a sense of himself. How did, how, how, much of a blow is it to him, do you think? The fines aren't big, but it stands convicted in a court of, of, of 
of a crime against the United States. Well, and it's also a, a charge from uh, a city that built Donald Trump, right? right? I mean, you think about when he made his first campaign announcement in 2015, it was down the golden escalator uh, in Trump Tower. When he made his first uh, campaign trip out to Iowa, it was on what ultimately got the nickname Trump Force One, and it was the Trump Organization plane with the letters T-R-U-M-P emblazoned on the body of the jet. Um, you know, that's a guy that has always bragged, right? I mean, it's someone who has said quite famously uh, that he wouldn't lose a supporter because he could walk outside of his Fifth Avenue office, which is where the Trump Organization lives, and shoot someone and he wouldn't lose a supporter. Um, Donald Trump and New York are synonymous. I think a lot of us right now, I know in my household, Terry, uh, we've probably watched Home Alone 2 800 times by now, thanks to my son, <laughs> and you see Donald Trump walking through the Plaza Hotel, correcting Kevin McAllister, right? N New York and Donald Trump are synonymous. That's how so many people around this country have associated him. And to think that New York on multiple fronts has broken up with Trump, and we've seen it, Trump has broken up with New York. He changed his residency to Florida. All of his children now live in Florida. And it is quite possible after this, the Trump Organization might follow suit. It's something that has been discussed, nothing official yet, but I do think that is the next uh, shoot to drop, if you will, uh, mm -hmm. as Donald Trump and New York continue their divorce. Huge consequences for the former president. It's got to hurt. It really does. John, thanks. Stand by. Let's bring in ABC News senior investigative reporter Aaron Katursky. Uh, Aaron, you've covered this trial. You're there in the moment. Uh, tell us uh, you know, what's going on, what it feels like, and what you think the importance and significance of this, these verdicts are. Terry, the importance of the verdict, I think, it, it cannot be overstated for the Trump organization. It is now labeled a felon and many other companies that it does business with may have internal policies preventing them from doing business with felons. It's possible loans get called in or contracts get canceled with the Trump Organization going forward. But this verdict came after about 10 hours of deliberations on the second day that the jury had the case. And they were guilty on all counts. The, the jury verdict, four women stood up, affirmed the verdict. Each member was questioned. Terry, the, the Trump Organization evaded taxes because some of its top executives schemed for years to get paid under the table with perks instead of proper salary. Things like uh, tuition for the grandkids to go to fancy private school here in Manhattan, rent for a nice apartment along the Hudson River, or e even extra cash at Christmas time. Alan Weisselberg, the chief financial officer, would write down his salary, falsify his W-2, and not declare those perks a as income. And the defense tried to say that, well, Weisselberg was just greedy, that the company had no benefit, but prosecutors said that there was an intent to benefit because the Trump Organization could pay less in salary and bonuses and pay a little bit less on its payroll taxes, too. Hmm. So a huge verdict for the Trump Organization. And Aaron, I just want to follow up. So this is the company founded by uh, Donald Trump's father, the Trump Organization, that has been now been found guilty of crimes, tax crimes, and conspiracy. But Donald Trump himself, personally, not a defendant in this trial, supposed to keep him very separate, but he was mentioned plenty in this trial. It was the elephant not in the room, as, as, as one of the lawyers said. What, what did we learn about Trump and, what, uh, and whatever possible uh, criminal liability, if any, he might face because of these shenanigans that a jury has now found uh, that Trump Organization was involved in. The Manhattan District Attorney's Office has an ongoing criminal investigation that could well target Trump in the future. That investigation had seemed dormant earlier this year, but has been revived in more recent months to go far as back as, as the hush payment to Stormy Daniels. Prosecutors have been looking at that again. And then there's all the, the ways that Trump would value his real estate holdings, uh, increasing their value when it suited his business interests or decreasing the value when he was seeking uh, some kind of, of loan or tax break. So Donald Trump is not out of the woods, even though he was not a defendant in this case that has now resulted in the conviction of his company. And you're right, Terry, Trump, though not a defendant, came up a lot. By one estimate, the defense brought him up 60 times to say he didn't know, but prosecutors said that he, in fact, sanctioned some of the tax fraud. All right, well, 
Uh, Aaron, thank you, and thank you for covering the, the trial for us. I know you're going to be busy with its aftermath. I want to bring in now former federal prosecutor Renato Mariani on, on these charges and this verdict. Uh, thanks for being with us, Renato. If I could just ask. What, what's for your... sanctioning criminal activity. Uh, so obviously uh, the, not a very good look for that company. And also I would just add a problem going forward for them because there is an ongoing civil case that the attorney general has brought seeking extraordinary remedies um, against the Trump organization, where, for example, uh, the organization uh, would, would potentially lose its license, no longer exists uh, in New York State, would have uh, all sorts of limits placed upon it. Uh, and in, in that same, you know, this is the same company, of course, that now has uh, been convicted of felony fraud charges. So I think very significant implications down the road for the Trump organization as well. And, and Renato, the president's talking about the economy in Arizona, so we're going to go to that for a minute. But I want to get one more quick thought from you on, on what a lot of people voted for Trump, right? There were 71 million in the last election, and Trump himself is saying that this was, that, that this prosecution began not with an investigation of a crime, but an investigation of a person. In other words, that this was targeted prosecution. What do you make of that? And, and you know, just as a former prosecutor, what do you think about that in this case? Well, it's a very, very bizarre uh, argument to make because Donald Trump wasn't charged. I mean, the, the Manhattan DA could have charged Donald Trump, did not do so, showed some restraint, which I think is uh, admirable. And here you have a company where the CFO of that company pleaded guilty to fraud and testified under oath that the, com that the company was committing fraud. How could you be surprised that a jury came to this conclusion? And certainly, how could you criticize the verdict? Uh, here, it's very difficult for me to understand uh, how you would expect a jury to come to any other conclusion, given the testimony of its CFO. Right. And the jury, once again, held to the standard of beyond a reasonable doubt in a criminal trial. And that's what they found. Uh, Renato Mariani, mm -hmm. and as well as Aaron Katursky, John Santucci, Brad Garrett. Thanks to all on this case. As I say, we're going to take you now to Phoenix, Arizona. President Biden is there. He's delivering remarks on his economic policies and the manufacturing sector in particular. Let's listen in. And Sanjay of Micron. Sanjay has represented more than two dozen tech and manufacturing companies. And you're here because you're seeing what we're all seeing. America Manufacturing is back, folks. America Manufacturing is back. I recently uh, took a trip literally around the world, starting in Egypt and ending up in Guam and finally coming home, ending with a meeting in Indonesia with the G20, the countries with many of the largest economies in the world. And what was clear in those meetings is the United States is better positioned than any other nation to lead the world economy in the years ahead if we keep our focus. There's a strong sense from many, from all the world leaders of the resiliency of the American economy, and uh, we're seeing it here at home with investments like the one we we're talking about today. Together, with the help of your elected leaders here today, we've had an extraordinary two years of progress. We passed the American Rescue Plan, keeping tens of thousands of cops, firefighters, teachers, first responders on the job in all 50 states when revenues dropped because of the, lake, the nature of the economy. We fully vaccinated more than 220 million people. We're rebuilding our infrastructure, fixing our roads, our bridges, our airports, strengthening American manufacturing by creating 700, 750,000 manufacturing jobs just since I've become president. What I'm most excited about is people are starting to feel a sense of optimism as they see the impact of the achievements in their own lives. It's going to accelerate in months ahead. And as part of the broad story about the economy we're building that works for everyone, one of the grow, one that grows from the bottom up and the middle out that positions Americans to win the economic competition of the 21st century. When we grow it that way, the poor have a shot, the middle class do well, and the wealthy do very well. My dad used to have a saying. I said, you say, a job is about a lot more than a paycheck, Joey. It's about your dignity. It's about respect. It's about being able to look your child in the eye and say, honey, it's going to be okay. It's going to be okay. Thousands of Arizonans are going to be able to look their kid in the eye because of what you're doing here today and saying, honey, it's going to be okay and mean it. Back in April 2021, 
I met with Mark and other industry leaders. TSMC had made a $12 billion investment here in Phoenix to build the first fab to make semiconductors in the United States. Now, the equipment is ready to move in. Next year, commercial operations are going to begin. And today, TSMC has announced a second major investment. It will construct a second fab here in Phoenix to build chips, the three nano chips, the three nano chip, chips that are three nano, and you know what I'm saying. <laughs> nano, no, no, I don't know. But look, these are the most advanced semiconductor chips on the planet. The chips will power iPhones and MacBooks, as Tim Cook can attest. Apple had to buy all the advanced chips from overseas. Now they're going to bring more of their supply chain here home. It could be a game changer. All told, TSMC is investing $40 billion here in Arizona, the largest foreign investment in the history of this state. Over 10,000 construction jobs and 10,000 high-tech jobs will be created. And I want to thank everyone in this company for making this happen. You know, I know our host won't mind my pointing out that America invented the chip. Morris Chang was a pioneer in the era of graduating from MIT and getting his start at Texas Instrument. Federal investment helped reduce the cost of those chips, creating a market and an entire industry that America led. Over 30 years ago, America had more than 30 percent of the global chip production. Then something happened. American manufacturing, the backbone of our economy, began to get hollowed out. Companies moved jobs overseas. Today, Today, we're down to producing only around 10 percent of the world's chips, despite leading the world in research and design of new chip technologies. But folks, where is it written? Where is it written that America can't lead the world once again in manufacturing? I don't know where that's written. And we're proving it can. $20 billion dollars do the same in Ohio. IBM is investing $20 billion in Poughkeepsie, New York, or this one up there. These investments are helping us build and strengthen the supply chain here in America. I want to be clear. As we build a stronger supply chain, our allies and partners are building alongside us as well. Some of the companies here today are customers that are going to buy these chips made here. Some are suppliers that are going to help make these chips. And they're all, they all depend on a strong supply chain. That's why we're doing what we're doing here in Arizona matters across the country and around the world. Folks, as we see here in Phoenix, the United States is a top destination for companies across the globe looking to make investments because we have a world-class, highly skilled, committed workforce, union labor. And more than, you can clap for that. More than 3,000 union workers, most highly trained and best in the world, are helping build this fab. The second fab will be built with union labor as well, and we're working with companies, community colleges, technical schools, universities, union-led apprentice programs and training programs. I've had a conversation with the Business Roundtable, all the major chambers of commerce. The reason why business should be hiring union folks, if you don't mind my saying, is simple. They're the best in the world. We're the single greatest technicians in the world. We're the best laborers in the world. And you build the best products. But you don't just decide that you want to be a pipe fitter or electrician like most people think. It takes four or five years of hard work as an apprentice. It's like going to college. You're the best trained workers in the world, and Wall Street didn't build this country, although there's a lot of good folks there. The middle class built the country, and unions built the middle class. As I said, we're making a once-in-a-generation investments in our nation's roads, bridges, railroads, ports, airports, lead-free water systems, high-speed internet. The biggest investment in American infrastructure since Eisenhower's interstate highway system. And here in Phoenix, we're building a new taxiway for Sky Harbor Airport to cut down how long planes wait to take off and arrive at a gate after landing. We're making flying in and out of Phoenix smoother and more economic. We're building a pedestrian bicycle bridge across the river in South Phoenix, extending light rail to connection families in South Phoenix with jobs and opportunities downtown. Down the road in, 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 in Buckeye, Core Power is making lithium-ion batteries to power electric vehicles and electric grid stor storage. 
It's a $1.2 billion investment. It's going to create thousands of good manufacturing jobs, 90 percent of which don't require a college degree, and yet you get a good wage. And we're replacing Phoenix diesel buses with new models powered by clean energy to significantly reduce pollution, especially for the folks getting on and off of those buses. Diesel exhaust can really make people sick. That's why we've been helping school districts all across America electrify their school buses to help kids avoid childhood asthma. And as of, and, and as of now, more than 326,000 households in, America, in Arizona are getting affordable high-speed internet thanks to our investment in infrastructure with much more to come. When Arizonans see the big picture, in your hometowns, cranes going up, shovels in the ground, workers with hard hats. I want you to feel the way I feel. Pride. Pride. We can do what we can do together is just anything, virtually anything. Folks, here's the bottom line. Our approach to building the economy of the future is from the bottom up and the middle out. And it's working. We've added jobs every single month of my presidency, 10.5 million new jobs. 750,000 of them, manufacturing jobs, exports are up, which means we're making things here in America and shipping the products overseas rather than shipping the jobs overseas to make things overseas and bring them back home. And we have much more to do. All this is why the economy grew 2.9 percent last quarter. And now inflation, the grocery store is coming down. Prices of things like clothing, televisions, appliances are going down. And there's good news for the holiday season. Gas prices have fallen below the levels they are before Putin's invasion of Ukraine. It's going to take time to get inflation back to normal levels as we keep our job market resilient. We could see setbacks along the way, to state the obvious. But we're laser focused on this. And all the hard work is making a real difference for people, including folks right here in Arizona, like Patricia McKinley, who owns her own small trucking business here in Phoenix. She has five employees. The pandemic hit her company hard. But these new infrastructure projects for Arizona mean more work for her and her team, a chance to grow her business, to secure her, her, her business. And Paul Sarosa, who grew up picking seasonal product, uh, seasonal produce here in Arizona, his parents believed in education. So Paul went to college and studied business. He launched a cleaning business. Now he has over 100 employees in his company. TSMC is now his biggest customer. And now they're expanding into Phoenix. Paul will be hiring a lot more workers. These are countless stories like these across the country where people are benefiting from what you all are doing. People working hard every day, never giving up, seizing every opportunity they can to get ahead. That's who this is about. Folks like Patricia and Paul. And they're why I'm unapologetic about fighting for American workers and getting the economy to work for working people. Let me close with this. It's been a rough few years for hardworking Americans, for businesses as well. A lot of families, and a lot of families, things are still pretty rough. But there are bright spots where America is reasserting itself, and the innovation and manufacturing boom here in Arizona is one of those places. I ask leaders of companies like TSMC this question. When the United States decides to invest considerable resources in a new industry that we need to build up, does that encourage business or to get them in the game, or does it discourage them? The answer is it encourages them. Federal investment attracts private sector investment, creates jobs and industry, and it demonstrates we're all in this together. And that's what today's about. I've never been more optimistic, and I mean this when I've been around a long while as you can see. <laughs> but I've never been more optimistic about America's future, and I really mean that. Never. We're building a better America. We just have to keep going, and I know we can. We're proving it's never, ever, ever, ever been a good bet to bet against America. Ever, ever, ever. <laughs> Folks, we just have to remember who we are. We're the United States of America, and there is virtually nothing, nothing beyond our capacity if we work together, not a single thing. So let's go keep this moving. God bless you all, and may God protect our troops. Thank you, thank you, thank you.
there's Joe Biden, the president of the United States. He's in Phoenix, Arizona. He's making remarks on the economy at yet another uh, uh, chip facility uh, that he is seeing and welcoming uh, their expansion in this economy, uh, as he has done in other states, and taking credit uh, for the expansion in essentially next generation energies. Uh, industries in energy, obviously, uh, with the major $368 billion uh, Inflation Reduction Act, they called it, but much of it was about climate change and the green energy industries that are coming up, batteries and cells and such, uh, and also chips. He got a major bill to uh, accelerate American chip manufacturing. That's what he's doing there. And he's taking a bit of a victory lap uh, there and once again trying to get the word out that although inflation may still be very painful and people are anxious about the economy he thinks things are going well and that's was the president's message let's let's get a bit of a closer look at that for more let's bring in abc news chief white house correspondent cecilia vega along with business reporter alexis christophers Celia, i want to go uh, to you first you cover joe biden on a regular basis first did i get that right is that is that what he's doing uh, out there and uh why why now what is well, what is he trying to do with the bully pulpit of the presidency by going to these chip factories and talking up uh, what they're doing there? Yeah, yeah, Terry, you're right when you say he's visiting another one because it's actually he's visited a few uh, in the last few months. And, and I and we should give a little context here um, because you hear semiconductors and and chips. And I, if you're like me, you're like, what what is that? And why does this affect my life? Well, they actually really do. They're a huge part of the, all of the lives that we live. If you have one of these, if you have a laptop, uh, there's a chip in one of them, a semiconductor chip in one of them. And they basically keep these personal electronic devices uh, and their batteries running. So they're hugely important. Uh, uh, and he's there, as you said, to tout this, and this is the key word here, bipartisan. Uh, he had Republican votes on that, that $50 billion Chips and Science Act that he signed into law back in August. So the why now of it, though, is really he is trying to show what you can get done when you have a bipartisan agenda. He didn't get very many bipartisan wins in his first two years in office, uh, but he is coming out of those midterms with a little bit of sail, uh, you know, a little bit of wind in his sails right now, and basically trying to, to send this message to Republicans and, frankly, to the country as he is now staring down a split chamber in Congress uh, starting next year that, look, when we work together, we can help Americans. This plant right here that he is talking about, you know, they're announcing a second plant in Arizona, $40 billion investment there from this Taiwanese company, and perhaps more to come if the U.S. ends up approving some grants in that area. So you're talking about tons of jobs. Uh, the president is saying that this is going to help the military uh, especially, and, and just we're talking about a huge number of jobs coming on the line from that. So he's basically there to wave that flag and say, look what we did. We need to do more of this. You know, and it's interesting, I want to follow up on something, Cecilia. And once again, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but it, 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 well, you, you said something that was very intriguing to me, which is that, uh, you know, he's, he's trying to send the message that he can work in a bipartisan way, you can get things done, practical things that the American people will benefit from. And I, I wondered, it, it felt to me like you didn't see a lot of that uh, over the past, what, couple of years. Obviously, we, there was the pandemic in the first part of his presidency still out there, still affecting travel and gatherings and such. But is this an effort, do you think, to sort of boost his stature as president so he gets a little more leverage in this divided Congress and says, look, the American people like what we did the last time, let's do some more. I, you and I both live and work in this town, and I, I think you're bringing um, the optimism that I love in you as my friend and office mate down the hall. I don't know if that's actually going to be the case uh, with a speech like this. Um, this is not the... Uh, Democrats and Republicans that Biden came up and spent three decades working with in the Senate. This is a completely different time. We live in a really polarized country. I don't need to tell you that. You talk about it every day on this show. I, I think what this is, is the president hoping to send that message. Um, I think at the end of the day, the reality is he has a really huge uphill battle going forward. Even if you just like extrapolate this one issue at hand, this issue of semiconductors and this $50 billion um, bill, some odd $50 billion bill that, that he signed into law back in August, he didn't have, Kevin McCarthy called this a corporate welfare and, and a blank check. So even on this issue, these issues like infrastructure, where you did have some, not a lot of wins, but he had some bipartisan wins, uh, it's going to be a really big battle going forward. And then you go, you know, you go, well, I'll put my all the way back hat on back to his inauguration back in January. You know, that remember that big speech, I'm going to be the president for all Americas, both Americas. It's not just one side of the aisle for me. 
it's been a really hard promise for him to keep uh, reaching out to both sides of the aisles. There's been a lot of obstruction, his team would say, uh, from Republicans, and I think they're bracing for a lot more to come in the next year ahead. Uh, absolutely, Cecilia. Chagrined though I may be, I, I, that was a necessary corrective to, to my <laughs> Pollyanna attitude there. But, but let me bring in Alexis on, on the economy. So the president is there in Arizona with this major investment of Chipsland. Tim Cook, of uh, the CEO of Apple, was is there as well. He spoke uh, a little bit before the president. And th this is part of, right, the next generation of American industry. The president, there's Tim Cook there at the same spot where, where the president was. He's, he seems uh, you know, to be ubiquitous uh, out there. And <laughs> Where, wherever Cook is, there's there's going to be some political action, seems this, these days a little bit. He is not shy about uh, knocking on the doors of presidents. But I want to ask about the economy and whether any of this really does make a difference. Because at the end of the day, what happens in Washington depends on the feelings of the American people. Biden is still disapproved of by a majority of the American people or a near majority, depending on the poll you look, polls you look at. And they they're continuing to be concerned about the economy. Is this relevant, what the president is doing today? Well, I just want to make a quick mention of Tim Cook and, and his appearance there today and how he's now saying he wants to switch that chip manufacturing over to Taiwan Semiconductor coming out of the U.S. That's a huge announcement and really marks a turnaround for Apple, and it shows just how much the company wants to reduce its reliance on Asian production. So definitely a win for the U.S. and a win for President Biden there as well. But, you know, I want to play devil's advocate here for a minute because, you know, when you have a U.S president who is actually visiting a foreign company's factory, it reflects, even though it is going to be here in the U.S., I think it reflects the U.S. reliance on a company like Taiwan Semiconductor. I mean, the U.S. makes about 12 percent of the world's computer chips right now. Three decades ago, uh, it was doing that 37 percent. So there's a huge divide there, and I think the U.S. right now is trying to have this renaissance or resurgence in the manufacturing industry, and so that's why we keep seeing President Biden sort of, you know, waving, waving the victory flag um, on days like these. But in terms of whether or not it's going to affect all of us. Look, Taiwan Semiconductor says it's going to probably create about 10,000 jobs with these factories in Phoenix. These are going to be high-paying technology jobs. It's not for most folks out there. We're still all dealing with higher prices for just about everything. You mentioned gas prices a few minutes ago. We've been getting a slight reprieve there, uh, but still they're very volatile and depend on a lot of geopolitical events, including what's happening with the war in Ukraine. So, um, you know, the last read we got on inflation was still near a 40-year high. We get another read on it next week. Uh, President Biden, you know, trying to put a positive spin here. But the fact is we are still all dealing with high prices and layoffs at a number of companies are starting to grow, Terry. Right. We've seen that in, in the news in recent days. But let me ask a, a big picture question. We asked presidents to do big things. At least that's that's part of the job. And I wonder, picking up on what you were talking about, about that staggering figure about how, what the percentage of the global chip manufacturing the United States did decades ago and how much we do now, whether there is a rebalancing going on, that, that's really what a Biden is trying, right? He's essentially built a fence against uh, Chinese chip manufacturers in some ways, uh, to, uh, trying to boost local uh, production. He's uh, uh, upset Europe a little bit by uh, the subsidies in the in the energy package that he pa that he passed that he got passed through Congress, and and just the awareness during the pandemic that it may not have been a great idea for the United States and other countries to offshore so much of their manufacturing sector to China and other low wage countries, and I just wonder if, if kind of that's what we're seeing here too with Tim Cook, uh, Tim Cook's announcement and Biden's effort to work with companies, to, but to bring the actual physical plant manufacturing and jobs to America. Yeah, I mean, we saw, of course, in the worst of ways during the COVID pandemic, how a supply chain can be upended. And just this past week with the protests we saw in China because of the COVID lockdowns they had there, it disrupted Apple's ability to make the new iPhones at, ex at the Foxconn facility there in China. And now a lot of people are going to have delays getting those phones in time for the holidays and what have you. So I think, again, it just highlights the reliance this country has had, growing reliance over the decades on Asian countries to produce much of our technology. And uh, I think, you know, it could be a bipartisan effort that 
everybody can get around, the fact that we want to bring a lot of this back on shore. Uh, of course, Republicans are going to say this is a blank check, that we're just handing out money and giving out these incentives to these companies. Uh, but you can bet that Biden's going to continue to say it is good for the uh, American worker. And uh, look, it's not bad for Apple to be able to say a product is made in America. Uh, absolutely. I once asked uh, Tim Cook, did he consider Apple an American company? And his answer was, we're a California company. <laughs> I'm not sure I understood what that <laughs> means. But I did hear you use the by word, the B word, the bipartisan word there. So maybe there is hope. Uh, uh, Cecilia Vega, Alexis Christophers, thanks for being with us. Thanks. Well, I'm Terry Mann. Thanks for streaming with us. We will follow news as it happens and keep it here on ABC News Live for more news and analysis ahead, especially Lindsey Davis is going to have full coverage of today's crucial Georgia Senate runoff election uh, starting at 7 p.m. Eastern. Uh, that's 7 p.m. tonight. Your voice, your vote, that Georgia runoff election. You can watch the results come in with Lindsey Davis tonight. There's more news coming up next.